welcome to Food for Thought, giving you the tools and resources you need to live according to your own values of compassion and wellness, joyfully, healthfully, deliciously, and sustainably. Today's episode is We Are Not a Single Movement, Plant-Based Radicals and Vegan Extremists. Before we begin, my name is Colleen patrick Goudreau. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com. This podcast is possible because of the support of listeners like you. So thank you for subscribing, for supporting, and for listening. You can join other supporters by going to patreon.com slash Colleen patrick Goudreau. It's a 100% listener podcast, and it always has been. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I hope you're doing well. I'm really excited to get into this topic with you today. It's been swirling around in my head for a very long time, and it was good to organize it all and now share it with you. If you are listening for the first time, some of this may be new to you and welcome. If you're a regular listener and someone who's been following me for a while listening to this podcast, reading my book, some of it will be familiar, but some of it will be new. And while I've written and talked about factionalism and fundamentalism and tribalism and perfectionism among vegans and animal advocates in the past, this particular topic, we are not a single movement, while related to those, related to tribalism and perfectionism, it's a relatively new idea. I debuted it, if you will, during my online Joyful Vegan conference in 2020. And I've hinted at it in various interviews from the past couple years. But after chewing on it for a while, it was time to just put it out there in a podcast episode and see if it resonates with you. So I've been an animal advocate, I've been vegan, and I've been a vegan educator for decades. And being such... I've lived among, circulated among, sought out, interacted with, worked beside other advocates and other vegans in what is generally called the movement, right? The vegan movement, the animal rights movement, the animal movement, the vegan community, right? Now, community is something I encourage people to seek out, a community of like-minded people, because once you become vegan and you stop participating in one of the most fundamental aspects of society, i.e. eating animals, it's so important to find others with whom you can relate, who speak the same language as you, others who just know what it feels like to feel like an outsider, to feel alien, to feel like you don't belong because you don't eat animals anymore, especially and including among people and in situations where you once did belong, right? Because you were sharing in the same socially accepted habit of consuming meat, dairy, and eggs. In my book, The Joyful Vegan, I identify finding your tribe, embracing your identity, building community, and feeling a sense of belonging. That's the title of that chapter. Finding your tribe as stage six on our journey. Being part of a community is vital for us as social creatures. And I think not being part of a community as vegans, as people not eating animal products or participating in animal exploitation, I think not being part of a community, not finding your tribe as such, is why many vegans struggle to feel joyful, to feel normal, and to stay vegan. So I urge you, everyone, to find your people, right? It's something we seek out very naturally. We have a very innate desire to belong. We're social creatures through and through. And so we tend to do this just because that's how we're built. And I talk a lot about how you can go about doing it because it's so important to do so. Now, of course, COVID has affected the ability for people and organizations to host in-person veg fests. We used to have a lot of those, uh, potlucks, conferences. These were one of the main ways new and veteran vegans, as well as the vegan curious, used to come together. It was one of the main ways, right? And while I'm certain they will happen again more regularly... At least some have been, and I think will continue to be, hosted online, hosted virtually. People have been asking me if I'll host my conferences again, and my answer is yes, not this year, uh, 2022, but yes, I will. I plan to. Just make sure you're on the mailing list at joyfulvegan.com to keep abreast of announcements. And of course, 
There are wonderful communities and groups and clubs online. There always will be. And there will be organizations offline. So we have many options. And of course, right now, while we're still coming out of this pandemic, uh, it makes it a lot easier to find like like-minded people. Uh, even before the pandemic, obviously, the internet makes it a lot easier to meet and find your tribe. Just knowing you're not alone and that other people think and feel as you do, that there's a commonality of experience is often enough to feel connected. Being part of a supportive community of people who share the same joys and heartaches, victories and challenges, pleasures and concerns, it's critical to staying vegan and to staying a joyful vegan. But then what starts to happen is you find your tribe, you find your community, and you start to see divisions even within the community that shares this commonality of not eating animal flesh and fluids, right? Like when you first found that community, like that was enough, like just to be among people who spoke the same language. That was the only price of admission, like not eating meat, dairy, and eggs. That was all you were looking for, just people who didn't eat animal products and didn't see you as a freak for not doing so either. And while you couldn't have recognized these divisions – while you were on the outside looking in, you now start to see factions within what we call the movement, right? Ethical vegans, health vegans, or just vegans versus plant-based, right? Even in the plant-based category or health vegans, you've got all of these subcategories. You've got whole foods, plant-based, whole food, plant-based, high-carb, low-fat, gluten-free, SOS, which is sugar, oil, and salt-free, right? You've got animal liberation versus animal welfare, abolition versus utilitarianism, animal rights versus animal reforms. And you start to notice that it's not just that these different factions, which is a natural part of kind of, you know, larger groups tend to break down into smaller ones, It's not just that they're there living amongst one another peacefully side by side. You start to notice that they're actually quite adversarial to one another. Now, someone from the outside would just see the commonality, a bunch of people who don't eat meat, dairy, and eggs, right? Or a bunch of people who care about animals, right? But once you're on the inside, you see the schisms. You see the cliques and the factions and the divisions within this larger group. And what's more, and this is critical... And this is what I'm here to talk about today. What's more is that the commonality is no longer enough. It's not enough that what you share is that you don't eat meat, dairy, and eggs. What becomes the focus is why you don't eat meat, dairy, and eggs, right? And that's when you see that some people are characterized as outsiders or imposters or fake vegans, or you're not a real vegan, or you're just plant-based, right? And that's said very derogatorily, meaning you're just vegan for health and not for the animals. And so you start to see these judgments that everyone holds. I mean, it's, it, it's not just, by the way, the vegans who say this about plant-based folks, you also see that on the flip side, you see, you know, plant-based folks or whatever category they want to call themselves, uh, people who do it for health reasons, uh, differentiate themselves because they're not junk food vegans, right? So you see this on both sides, you see it all around. Now, I've talked about this a bit when I've talked about fundamentalists who decry the use of the label vegan for anyone who doesn't take all the boxes of what they say vegan means, right? And they call anyone who doesn't submit to their interpretation fake vegans. We see that all the time. And what follows then is the belief that anyone who doesn't fall into that definition is uh, betraying the cause, right? It's a characteristic of fundamentalism to dwell on in-groups and out-groups. And while non-vegans are the obvious out-group, so are those who don't have the same or the right motivation, even though they share the commonality of not eating animal products. And so people talk about this as infighting, and we see it all the time. People ask me about it all the time, and people lament it. People lament that there's this infighting within the community, within the movement, But I think that perception that there is infighting within the community, within this movement, I think that's one of the problems. 
It's because we perceive there being a single precious movement whose purity needs to be protected and preserved. It's because of that notion that we perceive infighting. If instead we saw ourselves as separate movements that share a commonality, then there wouldn't be the presumption and the expectation that everyone has to think the same way or act the same way or label themselves the same or be motivated by the same goals, right? We'd see each as separate movements that share a common thread. And so ideally, I mean, the idea is that instead of fighting amongst each other, what we call infighting to preserve this purity, we would be inclined to share ideas and tactics and thoughts, right? We'd still disagree, but we don't have to fight to be right. We don't have to fight to preserve the integrity of what we think this large monolithic movement is, right? We wouldn't see those who share a commonality, but not motivated by the same things, right, as opponents soiling the integrity of the movement. We'd see them as allies, allies who enter the same space, the space called not eating animal products, but who came through different doors, right, who have different reasons for doing so, for different reasons for not eating animal products, but with whom we have more in common than with those who never enter the space at all. Now, I'm a visual person, so let me paint this picture for you. I like using the analogy of an amphitheater, right? Picture a huge amphitheater, like the Colosseum in Rome, or large stadium, a large arena. You've got several entrances to this amphitheater, several passages through which you can enter this large arena. Everyone's there because they share some commonality. Everyone enters because they share a commonality. Maybe they're there to watch a sports game or see a concert. And while they may have entered through different doors and arrived at different times, they're all there in that place because of what they have in common. The desire to watch and enjoy some kind of spectacle, sports game or a play or a musical performance. And when everyone looks around... They're like, hey, cool, we're all here. We're like all rooting for this team or we all love this particular band or singer uh, and we all want to experience the joy and pleasure of the music or whatever it is, right? And there's this energy in the space because everyone shares this commonality, facing the same direction, excited to be there, excited to be there with like-minded people. We kind of feed off of that energy, right, of the tribe being there for the same, for the same purpose. Now, there are millions of people outside that arena who never enter, who don't share this commonality, who don't even want to come in. And that's fine. Everyone else out there, which is most of the people, the majority of the people, they're missing out, but we're together. We know the secret handshake. We know the value of what we're here to share. We chant and sing together and we feel good. This is exactly what we seek out when looking for people who also just don't eat animal products, right? I'm thinking, you know, we, we eat, we're on a plane. I mean, that's maybe an anachronism these days, but we're on a plane or we, we, I don't know, we meet a friend of a friend and they tell us they're also vegan and we're so excited. We haven't asked yet why they stopped eating animal products and we will, right? But we're just so happy that there's someone else there in the same club. We could be at a party and there's someone else across the room, you know, you found out that they're also vegan because they're eating the same food you are and you're the only two in this party at the party who you know who are not eating all of the animal products and you're just happy there's someone else there in the same quote unquote club right someone who just shares the basic criterion they don't eat meat dairy and eggs period that's simple now imagine in this amphitheater people start to turn to one another and ask, how did you get here? And why did you come? And who's your favorite player? And what's your favorite song? Well, why is that your favorite song? And why did you come through that door? That's the wrong door. And why were you compelled to come for that reason? Why not this reason? Have you considered this reason? And they start to forget about all the people out there who didn't even want to come. <laughs> and they start to criticize and turn on each other 
right? They stop thinking about how many people out there might benefit from and enjoy and savor what we all came for. People who don't even know the pleasure and the joy they could experience if they just walked through these doors, right? Instead, we focus on the person next to us and the passage they came through. Why that passage? Why not this passage, right? And so we forget the elation of just being in this amphitheater together, of celebrating together what so few people know is possible. We press the person next to us with whom we have more in common than anyone else outside this arena at this moment in time, right? We stop focusing on what makes us similar and we focus on what makes us different, right? In this, in the case of our story, um, you know, we forget that we're all there just because we don't eat animals uh, and we focus on why we came in the first place and why we stopped eating animals in the first place. Now, I've talked about this before. Many of you will be familiar with the term that Freud coined called the narcissism of minor differences. This phenomenon, this peculiar fact that people who have the most in common tend to have the nastiest and the cruelest fights with each other. Uh, It it describes this um, intensity of feelings that arise between groups of people with seemingly trivial differences. Again, people looking in from the outside, uh, right? But who battle one another over the importance of those differences and use them as the basis to distinguish themselves from and attack each other, right? Sound familiar? Well, now you have a name for it. The narcissism of small differences. Now, I don't know if you remember this comedian or if you've ever heard of him. His name's Emo Phillips. And Uh, Like all good comedians, he's also a social commentator and a brilliant one at that. And my favorite skit of his, this is Emo Phillips, is one that I think perfectly characterizes this narcissism of small differences. He tells a story about a day he saw a guy on a bridge about to jump and he cried out, don't do it. And the man shouted, no one loves me. And... Phillips replied, I do, and God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too. What franchise? Baptist? Me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? Northern Baptist? Me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? Northern Conservative Baptist, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Council of 1912? Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Council of 1912. I said, die, heretic, and I pushed him over, right? It's perfect because it's so true. And we see this in our little world. Are you vegan? Yes. Are you an ethical vegan or a health food vegan? Health food vegan. Me too. Whole foods plant-based or whole foods high-carb, low-fat plant-based? Whole foods high-carb, low-fat plant-based? Whole foods high-carb, low-fat, no oil, salt, free, sand, sugar plant-based? No, I eat oil. Die, heretic. I mean, literally, people <laughs> just are like, oh, God, that's the worst thing in the world. How could you do that, Right. I mean, you see what I'm getting at. Someone looking in from the outside would see no difference whatsoever. I'm thinking of um, the running joke on the old uh, radio show, Prairie Home Companion, where Garrison Keillor used to talk about the the rivalry between Lutherans and Methodists. And like from the outside, I'm like, I, there doesn't seem to be a difference. But of course, wars have been fought over these differences. People have been killed over these differences. Now, it's not to say that some things don't mean something, right? That that differences don't mean something, that there is that there isn't that it's not worth talking about a distinction between things. Of course that's true, right? We of course there are ways we distinguish ourselves from one another. It's a very human trait to distinguish ourselves from one another. The problem is when we lean too heavily on the narcissism of small differences and focus on trivialities uh, rather than on what really matters. Now Emo Phillips' joke makes us laugh and nod our heads in agreement, but of course it's not a joke when you look underneath the many instances of in religion, in culture, in geopolitics where people do kill one another that they deem heretical 
or just different, right? The animosity that's existed between Croats and Serbs, North Irish Protestants and Catholics, the Scottish and the English, the Shiites and the Sunnis, the difference between whether God is everywhere or only in sacred places, the difference between uh, you know who can be baptized and who can't be, about how you find salvation, about transubstantiation among Christian sects. The bloodiest wars have been fought over what seems like trivialities to outsiders, among those who seem the most similar. If you look at some of the fiercest rivalries in history, what's striking is not how different the opposing groups are, but how similar. And this phenomenon explains why people are more likely to be killed by someone who shares the most in common with them, but who are deemed traitors or dissenters, right? Gandhi was killed by a Hindu fundamentalist because Gandhi wanted to help the Muslim Pakistanis, right? Itzhak Rabin was killed by an Israeli, an extreme right-wing conservative who thought Rabin was selling out the Israeli people by making concessions. Anwar Sadat was killed by an Egyptian, a fundamentalist who believed he had betrayed the Palestinian cause by making a peace treaty with Israel. Now, I'm not saying that our situation is exactly the same, and that there's a risk of assassination among those who disagree. But you get my point. We reserve our most virulent emotions for those towards those who resemble us the most. We feel threatened not by the other with whom we have little in common, in our case, non-vegans outside that arena, but by the nearly us, the nearly we, those who mirror and reflect us. And we see this play out again and again and again among those who don't eat animal products, but who do so for different reasons. We seek out a tribe of people who don't eat animal products, but then we start differentiating ourselves further and further until our tribe becomes so restrictively exclusive and the criteria to join so unreasonably high. And I'll tell you something, people look and in from the outside, also go, that doesn't look like fun. I don't think I want to be part of that. Or they disown what really might be something that they care about, but don't want to associate themselves with or affiliate with those who are aggressive or judgmental or unkind or et cetera, et cetera. So not only are we making it difficult for people to stay in the arena, people with whom we have a common, a commonality, we're also making it pretty unattractive for other people to even enter, right? Now, I talk about the light and dark sides of tribalism in The Joyful Vegan, and indeed it is a human trait. It's not always negative. Any fans of a sports team can attest to that, right? Tribalism is, again, an inherent human trait. Uh, and it comes from the fact that for thousands of years, an individual's identity was almost entirely subsumed by the tribe to which he or she belonged. Each tribe felt it was superior to the next tribe, and the veracity of this claim was easily and simply determined. One village would clash with another, and whoever was stronger and craftier came out the victor until they battled again. And it's no different for us in our little worlds. We may not be having literal battles to the death, but we are having clashes that I think are detrimental to the larger cause, detrimental to our own spirits, detrimental to our own compassion and our own integrity, right? When we place a higher value on minor differences, I might even say micro differences, than on the major and more fundamental similarities. And in doing so, we waste precious time and precious energy in focusing on what sets us apart from each other. We squander so many opportunities to learn from each other, to share ideas with each other, to understand what we can from each other, and to inspire more people to enter that amphitheater, right? So it's true that tribalism and the narcissism of small differences are human impulses that have played out time and time again over the centuries across the globe and most likely will continue to. But that doesn't mean we can't do better. That doesn't mean we can't learn from the past and learn from what doesn't work, from what's detrimental. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Just because we once did something doesn't mean we have to keep doing it. Just because we're compelled to do something doesn't mean we have to do it. We know this from our arguments against tradition, right, or whatever other excuses people use to keep eating meat, dairy, and eggs. So we can do better, right, even though 
it's a human impulse. We can do better. I think in terms of our little world of people who eat plants only and not animals, I think there's room for improvement. That's why I'm suggesting that not only do we amplify the big commonality rather than dwell on the small trivialities, but also that we actually acknowledge our differences and see them as strengths, right? That instead of seeing our differences as defects to fix or impurities to avoid or wrongs to correct, we see them as opportunities to learn from and understand. That we stop seeing ourselves as one large single movement that needs to be kept pure that needs to be purged of those who don't really fit this definition or that definition or this criteria or that criteria. Rather, we see ourselves as independent allies sharing a commonality, not eating animals, whose motivations may be different, health, animal rights, environment, right? But whose experiences and perspectives are valuable and valid and may ultimately help inspire more people to enter that amphitheater so they may experience the joy and pleasure of not eating animals. We can be in this amphitheater together. We can acknowledge our commonality and still set up different rooms next to each other, right? Celebrate our uniqueness, right? Diversity keeps things interesting and engaging and fresh and free and flexible and healthy. As people from the outside see that it's kind of appealing to enter this arena, and as they see themselves in others they'll come. Some through this door, some through that door. And once they're in, they would feel a sense of belonging, regardless of which door they entered through. Some may go into that room, some may go into this room, right? And and guess what? They can walk from one room to another, right? No one's mandated to stay in one room, right? And labeled this or labeled that because they started there. They can walk between and among the different rooms, sharing and learning along the way. And this is the reality for most everyone who enters this world. You come in for one reason and you stay for many. We can care about many things at the same time. We see this all the time. People who become vegan for health reasons feel comfortable enough looking further into the ethics of being vegan for the animals, right? No longer participating in the consumption of animals. And we all experience this, thus relieved of those pangs of guilt. Then we have the the capacity, the mental capacity, the emotional capacity to learn more because we're not participating in it, right? Things that we avoided looking at when we were participating in it, now we can say, well, I can look at that over here, right? And so they do. And, and, And we can be in the room next to them saying, I'm over here when you need me. I'm over here when you want to look. And I'm, and you know, keep showing what you're showing, right? But I'm over here. Come on and come on in, right? Similarly, people who become vegan for the animals initially tend to consume a lot of transitional foods, a lot of, you know, more heavily processed foods like vegan meats and cheeses and eggs, right? Right. As if making up for all the foods they thought they wouldn't be able to eat before they became vegan, right? But over time, they might want to learn more about, you know, whole foods plant-based or the health benefits of incorporating more whole foods into their diet. And they can walk over to that room over there and be like, what have you, what have you got for me? What, what, what can you show me? What can I learn from you? It's not our job to interrogate those who come through the space or to litigate why someone enters the space and decide whether they should be there or not. The space that most people don't even enter or even know exists, it's our job to just be welcoming, regardless of the whys and the wherefores. If the only thing we have in common is that we don't eat meat, dairy, and eggs, that's a lot, especially when you consider how many people do eat meat, dairy, and eggs. When I look at the friction and the discord among ethical vegans and plant-based health vegans or animal welfareists and animal liberationists, all I see is a waste of energy. I see implosions. I see myopia. I see rigidity. We can have different opinions. We can have different experiences. We can have different perspectives. We can disagree with what someone else thinks without blowing the whole thing up. Now, Naturally, we're going to gravitate to those whose perspectives uh, resonate most with us, right? 
And we can do that without accusing those who don't resonate with us as being, I don't know, fake or imposters or sellouts, right? As if we all have to conform to the same way of thinking or acting in order to legitimately be in this space, right? Find the people with whom you are most aligned, then get to work and stop focusing on other people doing the work you're not doing or just being not you, like (laughs) just being not you, right? And so in the wider animal protection movement, so under this umbrella called animal protection movement, there are several different types of approaches and different organizations and tactics and advocates, right? And, you know, I've named some of them before. You've got like, you know, an organization that's just going to focus on animal laws. You've got an organization that might focus on helping people become vegan. You've got an organization on uh, helping, uh, you know, just welfare, whatever. I mean, you've got all these different sects uh, in the animal protection movement. And over the years, I I can't even tell you how many times, I mean, people always ask me my opinion. Well, what do I think about that? What do I think about that organization? What do I think about that tactic? What do I think about that approach? Now, I'm going to answer that question in terms of, you know, you know, I have an opinion about what I think is most effective, but I also have an opinion about what I think I'm best at right? That's, that's also different than what I think is most effective. <laughs> like no one's ever going to, there's never going to be one answer anyway. But it's often couched and asked in the sense of like, why, you know, I don't want to support this organization over there because they're kind of sellouts. They're just, they're not doing it for, you know, they're not there to support veganism. They're not there for animal rights. It's only animal, it's only animal welfare or welfare standards or whatever. So don't you think like they're not great because like they're not really animal rights and they're more welfare. I mean, like, right. I mean, as if there's an answer to it, my answer is that there's room for everyone. And some people are going to be attracted to that. Some people are going to be, you know, want to support that. Others don't have to. I mean, there's countless organizations and advocates and tactics whose mission like doesn't resonate with me and countless organizations and advocates and tactics that do. So I'm going to gravitate to the ones that I'm interested in, just like you'll gravitate to the ones you're interested in. I mean, like the organizations, they're just like doing their work. They have their mission, right? And if you want to work for one of these organizations or I don't know, consult with them if you have thoughts about how they could be doing it better. I guess you could do that, right? But they know that, you know, they have their mission. They're attracting the people who are most aligned with it. That's great, right? It's just so futile to criticize an organization or an individual for being who they are and doing the work that they're doing, right? As opposed to doing the work that you think they should be doing. I mean, you can't be a sellout if you're working on what your mission is. I mean, like, I I see it a lot with the animal welfare and the animal rights organizations. The animal welfare organizations are just who they are. They're just, they're saying this is who I am, right? But, so don't support them or don't hang out with them. I don't know, just, it, okay. <laughs> it's like the example I've used. I, I've seen, you know, negative reviews for, for instance, The Joy of Vegan Baking, my first book, because I use sugar and butter and oil, obviously non-dairy butter, but I, I'm using, you know, kind of less wholesome ingredients. But I never said the book was anything other than a baking book. I never said it was a book of salad recipes. So if you don't want to buy the book, just don't buy the book. But it's like giving a one-star rating to a science fiction movie because it's not a romantic comedy. They're just different, right? One's going to appeal to one person and another's going to appeal to somebody else. But every moment spent focusing on what they're not doing or what they're doing wrong uh, and focusing on how you're not them and they're not you, you're not spending time on developing and cultivating who you are and what you want to do and what you want to do well. Instead of worrying about whether someone else advocates in a slightly different way or stops eating animals for a slightly different reason, we should simply care about doing what we do and doing it excellently. The other benefit of seeing others as different rather than wrong is it opens us up to building alliances and coalitions. Now, sometimes I hear vegan and animal activists, vegan activists, vegan vegans, (laughs) talk about the need to build alliances and coalitions. But they're often talking about building bridges between themselves 
and people in movements outside the vegan plant-based and animal arenas, right? Such as environmentalists or human rights advocates or civil rights advocates, right? And while we can and should do just that, I suggest we do the same with those in our own backyard, with those in our own amphitheater. How are we going to find ways to work with others with whom we have less in common if we can't even work with those with whom we have the most in common, right? Isn't that the best place to start? Isn't that a place to practice? Low-hanging fruit and all that? Narcissism of minor differences be damned? I mean, building bridges means just listening to someone else's perspective. It starts there. I mean, that I know is hard enough for most of us. It's challenging. It can be. It can be challenging to hear someone else's perspective, especially if it's antithetical to yours. But let me assure you that your perspective, your belief, your ethics, your values will not be weakened by hearing somebody else's that contrasts with your own. So just acknowledging that different doesn't mean inferior is a really good place to start. And just listening to each other's perspectives, right? And then we can identify common goals and common methods and we can, en- we can engage in joint problem solving. But first we just have to recognize and appreciate that we are different and different doesn't mean bad, that we have more in common than not, right? That we have more in common collectively than we do with anyone else outside our arena. Can we at least just start there? Can we at least just stop staring at our belly buttons, asserting how we're different, and by different we often mean superior to others with whom we share so much, with whom we could accomplish so much? Now, I do think there is an element of posturing, especially on social media, right? Making sure that your audience and your followers know that, you know, you're on this side and 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 in order to do that and strengthen your own position you have to differentiate yourself from the opposing perspective so i do think some of that's posturing and crowing and if you want to do that all right you're probably not even listening to this podcast anyway but if you want to be effective and not just right Uh, or popular, then I think there's a lot we can do. And we can model it for others who are watching. Now, I have some bonus material for Patreon supporters at every level, and you'll be seeing that in your Patreon account. I'm going to be sharing a story of how adversarial actions within the suffragette movement, obviously a hundred years ago, uh, quite negatively affected the goal to get voting rights for women. It hindered it. It delayed it. It turned sympathetic members of the public away and also negatively impacted individual relationships and reputations because that's important too. So look out for that in your Patreon account. I'm going to talk more about that uh, in this bonus episode. And if you're not a supporter, be sure to go to patreon.com and become a Patreon supporter and you'll get perks such as that. I, for one, don't want to do anything to hinder helping animals. And I know you don't want to either. And I don't think the people who who posture in this way actually think they are hindering helping animals. I think they think they're helping animals. Uh, But speaking for myself, I want to do everything I can to help animals and encourage more people to eat plant foods over animal products, right? And we've got a lot of work to do. We need each other. We're already in the minority. For millions of people, not eating animals is ridiculous. It's unnecessary. It's unnatural. It's even dangerous. Millions of people believe animals are here for us, that breeding and raising animals for human consumption is the most normal thing in the world, and that animal agriculture is the only way. Millions of people think eating only plants is unhealthy, unsatisfying, unfulfilling, boring, tasteless, inconvenient, Those are the status quo perspectives we need to upend. Not eating animals is already seen as radical in people's eyes. So this idea, this criticism against groups or individuals who focus on recipes, I've seen that among animal advocates, criticizing people who are doing what is authentic for them, focusing on recipes or health or nutrition, And they would say, it's not radical enough, 
right? Because they're not showing slaughter videos. It's absolutely ridiculous and unfair and unkind and untrue. It is radical to show that you can make bacon out of shiitake mushrooms. That blows people's minds. It is radical to teach that the nutrients we need are plant-based, that we don't need to drink cow's milk to get vitamin D. It is radical to demonstrate that you can healthfully carry a baby to term without eating animal products. To the mainstream, that's radical. It's radical to stand up for what you believe in, whatever it is, and speak up and be the voice that goes against the grain, the voice in your family. When everyone else thinks you're nuts, that's radical. In fighting with those who are already on your side, we forget who our adversary is, our real adversary. In my opinion, the true adversary is the mindset that says animals are here for us to do with as we please. It's the mindset that says it's normal to eat animal flesh fluids and ferments because it's from that mindset that laws are made, that policies are made, that products are made, that habits and traditions are entrenched. It's that mindset we're trying to change. When we fight inwardly, we get distracted and we lose perspective and focus and efficacy. Every moment spent fighting with someone who already shares your radical perspective that we don't need meat, dairy, and eggs to be healthy and happy, to find pleasure and flavor, to experience abundance and joy is a moment you could be spending time outwardly facing, changing that mindset, writing posts or making videos about why animals matter, writing posts or making videos about why plants are the most healthy and delicious things to eat, writing op-eds about why animal agriculture is a problem, writing op-eds about why meat, dairy, and eggs negatively affects children's health, writing op-eds about why plant-based options in schools are good for learning, writing letters to the editor in response to the thousands of articles that come out every day about animals, food, animal agriculture, politics, environment, climate change, thousands of articles a day, you could be writing a letter to the editor in your local paper, regional paper, national paper, right? We could be proactively talking about the positive role animals play in our ecosystems and the negative effects of animal agriculture. We could talk about how intelligent farmed animals are. We could be working with a local or regional or state or federal legislator to enact animal-friendly and vegan-friendly legislation. We could be spending time telling our followers about animal-friendly legislation that they should contact their legislators about, right? We could be making a video featuring delicious plant-based recipes. We could be volunteering with a wildlife organization. We could be volunteering with an animal shelter. We could be visiting a school and talking to kids about animals and food and nature, virtually or in person. You could be finding a nonprofit to work with to incorporate compassion into their mission, right? Or an environmental organization or a soup kitchen who wants to implement more plant-based policies but doesn't know where to start. We could be working with restaurants to serve more vegan options and working with them to market them appropriately and effectively. We could be writing a TED Talk. We could be, you could be using your art or whatever your talent is to help animals and to promote plant-based eating. You could be talking to your neighbors about how they can help wildlife in your neighborhood and checking next door and different neighborhood listservs to speak on behalf of animals. We could be planting trees. We could be reading a book to be Become more educated about the issues you care about and how to be a better communicator. You could be writing to your favorite advocate or organization to ask them how you can help them so they can be more successful instead of staring at our belly buttons and arguing with the people with whom we have most in common. Do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Do you want to have integrity in your interactions with people who agree with you and disagree with you? Do you want to manifest the compassion you say you have for other animals that we could better demonstrate to our fellow human animals? Do your work, then step back. Own who you are. Do what you do with excellence and let others do the same. You can find more on this topic in this podcast and in The Joyful Vegan. 
Uh, you can find many chapters in the book and many episodes in this podcast related to effective communication strategies, tribalism, purity. There's so much. You can search on whatever you use to listen to podcasts. You can go to joyfulvegan.com. I hope to see you over there. I hope to see you one day in one of my online cooking classes. And on one of my vegan trips, we have a couple spots that just opened up for our mountains, lakes, and canals trip to northern Italy. And we have space left in our under the Tuscan sun in Italy. And our trip to Rwanda, where we will be hanging out with gorillas, mountain gorillas, and in the forests of this incredible country. Join me there. Thanks for joining me here. Thank you for supporting this podcast, for subscribing, for listening, and for leaving ratings and reviews for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick-Gaudreau. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.